really sounds like everyone has a good understanding of what backbiting is. Essentially, in any context, speaking ill of someone, pointing out their faults or mistakes or whatever it is, um, speaking ill of someone who is not present. And because you're supposed to do it to their face. Um, no, that's sort of a <laughs> another thing, but I will, I will address like different ways that things can be handled. Um, and it also sounds like I don't need to like illust illustrate to you how immersed we are in this practice in our culture. It sounds like all of you completely understand whether it's, you know, in the workplace, intimate settings between friends or, social media, the tone of the, you know, produced media that we absorb. Sounds like all of you totally get it. And um, kudos for hosting this, this space and this conversation. And the podcast that a couple of you guys mentioned was called Overcoming a Culture of Backbiting where I did express the view that this is one of the things that this is one of the illnesses of our society right now, all those things that you guys already pointed out and addressed, and we're all suffering the consequences because it's incredibly damaging to relationships, to the cohesion of communities, whether it's work, whether it's family. Uh, that's a great question. The podcast, it's called Spiritual Conversation, and maybe towards the end we could drop a link in the chat. It's a good question. Um, so yeah, this is one of the reasons why everything feels so divided and why it's so hard to have conversations. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes and kind of go all the way through, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. And I am going to do my best to frame this whole topic in a spiritual perspective and how it fits into the Baha'i faith and how it fits into the mission of the Baha'i faith, which is to create world unity and happiness on all levels for all peoples. And after I do that, I hope that as a group, like after we've sort of immersed in the spiritual perspective, we can really sort of explore even more practically, all of those solutions will, we're all wanting. Like, well, how do I actually handle this at work, you know? And what do I actually do with my social media presence or whatever? So a lot of those, I hope, you know, sort of the wisdom of the group will come forth. But first, I would like to start with a broad overview of the Baha'i faith, this beautiful religion, and share how this prohibition against backbiting fits in to this much larger picture. So with that, Cameron, if we could pull up the slides. Um, those of you who are on like desktops, you can split your screen so you can still see me or see each other and see the slides at the same time. Does, does anyone want any help with that who's on a laptop or desktop? We all good? All right. So the Baha'i faith is an independent religion. So it's not a branch of any other faith. And the aim of the Baha'i is to unite all of the diverse peoples of the world in one common faith and one universal cause. And you could say in one shared collaborative vision. And Baha'is are followers of Baha'u'llah, who they see as the promised one of all ages, who has brought us the teachings of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith recognizes that there is one loving creator God that is called lots of different names and lots of different cultures, but it's all the same powerful loving source. And since God made us, our capacity to understand God is very limited, but God loves us and wants to have a relationship with us and, in fact, promises never to leave us without guidance. And God does this, in the Baha'i view, through divinely inspired messengers. You could say prophets with a capital P, 
And Baha'is often refer to these messengers, some of whom you know, like Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Zoroaster. We refer to them often as manifestations, like a mirror perfectly manifests the light of the sun. And so these divinely inspired people, beings, perfectly manifest the word and the will of God. And Baha'u'llah is the most recent of these. And Baha'u'llah says, this is the day and age when, look, you have an understanding of yourselves as one globe. This is the first time in known history that something like world peace, as far-fetched as that may sound, is actually possible because we are conscious of ourselves as one world, as being intricately connected and on this little, this blue globe out in space, you know? So let's move to the next slide. Baha'u'llah says that this is the day in which God's most excellent favors have been poured out upon men, and it is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world to reconcile their differences and with perfect unity and peace abide beneath the shadow of the tree of his care and loving kindness. And in order to facilitate this, Baha'u'llah has brought laws and teachings. And, you know, sometimes the idea of a religious law strikes people as just, you know, something that's going to curb your fun, you know? But I'm going to show you the next slide and see if this feels resonant with you. Let's go to the next slide. Chaos and confusion are daily increasing in the world. Have you noticed? They will attain such intensity as to render the frame of mankind unable to bear them. Then will men be awakened and become aware that religion is the impregnable stronghold and its laws, exhortations, and teachings, the source of life on earth. So I bet you do relate to that quote. And, and it, it really makes sense that, you know, maybe we need guidance that's bigger than us, you know, because we're, we're making a lot of trouble, seems like. So it's within this context that we're going to dive into the topic of backbiting, which is the, this prohibition is one of the laws and exhortations that Baha'u'llah has given to help us achieve this unifying of all people. So it's so common. We're so immersed in it. As Julia said, it can start out very innocently and then, you know, go south. So how bad can it really be, right? Well, let's go to the next slide. These are some of the things that the Baha'i writings say about it. The worst human quality, the most great sin, the cause of divine wrath. It has a foul smell. It's the most hateful characteristic. Accursed, quencheth the light of the heart, extinguisheth the life of the soul, and is divisive. So let's go to the next slide. This is the one I find the most terrifying. It can make the dust to settle so thickly on the heart that the ears hear no more and the eyes no longer behold the light of truth. My understanding of this passage is that it actually impedes our own ability to recognize the truth. And if we don't have that, like, we're lost, you know? And some of you may be thinking, well, you know, of course I would never weave falsehoods about someone. Like, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not going to say things that aren't true about someone. Um, but if it's true, it's, it's okay, right? Well, let's go to the next slide and the one after that. There we go. Even if what is said against another person be true, it's true. He really did it. She really did it. The mentioning of his faults to others still comes under the category of backbiting and is forbidden. So what should we do instead? Right? Well, let's go to the next slide. 
And why is this so bad? And these are some of the reasons that I have excavated from the writings. One is not only is it easier to complain of others than put into practice love, constructive words, and cooperation, but as far as vices go, it's also very easy to do. Not only are we surrounded by it, not only is it endorsed by our culture, but literally all you have to do is open your mouth. You know, like other vices, you know, you might have to like buy some substance and you have to open it or whatever. Like you have all these opportunities to check yourself, but all you have to do is express yourself in the wrong way and you have fallen into backbiting. And it's my personal opinion that when we achieve that sort of cheap, temporary catharsis of just complaining about someone, that we're less likely to reflect on how we might be able to resolve the issue. And this could be that someone is being unkind to other people at work, or it could be a policy that we disagree with. Lots of different manifestations of this. And Let's go to the next slide. We have an obligation. We have a, both a responsibility and a bounty to help make our world better. We have been created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. So if you bypass an opportunity to try to resolve something, then you're missing one of the purposes of life, which is to make this world better than before you were here or than it would be without your presence. So I feel that um, it opens up more opportunities to try to, again, reflect how, how could I help this issue and actually take action if you remove that catharsis of just complaining about it. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, all of those energies of fault finding and judgment actually serve a high purpose when we use that energy to reflect on our own faults and think how we can do better. And the Baha'i writings say that this, in fact, is a full life job. It requires all our attention, our willpower and energy to address our own character. And in fact, if we use that energy on other people, we're wasting precious time. And that means like precious time alive. That's, that's what this means here. So we have, I think someone needs to maybe put themselves on mute. Um, so we have this dual responsibility and opportunity to both refine our characters in this lifetime and also try to contribute to the world around us to make it better. So next slide, please. And this one is probably the one the writings are most clear about, that backbiting is divisive, which means that it's completely antithetical to that unifying aim of the Baha'i faith. And again, when I say Baha'i faith, it's also just the you know, prescription for this day and age to bring people together in a unified, loving, and inclusive way. So backbiting is divisive. It is the leading cause among people for a disposition to withdraw. And when people are withdrawing themselves, there's less and less opportunities to be inclusive, to collaborate, to see how other people think, and to make the world a better place. And if you speak ill of an absent one, the only result will be to dampen the zeal of the friends and tend to make them indifferent. And I think when there's backbiting, there's like this trifecta, right? There's the person who's speaking or expressing complaint. There is the person they're talking about, the person or entity. And then there's the audience or the person who's listening. And in that situation, Trust between all three is damaged. And the zeal, the passion, the enthusiasm for all of them is harmed. So a lot of you brought up, I think the next slide is what to do if someone else is backbiting. Let's see. Yeah, 
So in that scenario, that trifecta, the speaker, the listener, and the person being talked about, you know, what do we do if someone else is backbiting? And it's really challenging, folks. I have found in my personal life, it's actually extremely challenging to try to uphold this. But we are asked, we're told that we're guilty of complicity in backbiting. That most hateful characteristic, that most great sin that extinguisheth the life of the soul. If we listen to backbiting and therefore as tactfully as possible, yet firmly, do our utmost to prevent others from making accusations or complaints against others in our presence. And this is very challenging, and I hope this is something we'll talk more about in the question and comment section, because um, sometimes it, it, it feels very counterculture, you know, to say, oh, actually, I would really love not to talk about this right now. Um, but the responsibility really rests on us. Are we going to choose to not make an awkward moment out of it over this larger idea of contributing to the betterment of the world and following the exhortations of God? You know, it's one of those really fundamental questions. So tactfully yet firmly do our utmost. And what are some other things we can do? Well, we have addressed that those energies of fault finding, anytime we find ourselves judging someone else or upset at someone else, we can use that as like a wake-up call to remember, oh yeah, I'm not perfect either. And I'm supposed to direct those energies towards myself in an empowering way so that I can work on improving myself. Another bit of advice from the writings is maybe just avoid talking about people altogether. We can go to the next slide. So stories repeated about others are seldom good. A silent tongue is safest. Even a good story may be harmful if spoken at the wrong time or to the wrong person. And I'm sure you've experienced this as well, whether it, you know, seems to you know, uh, offend someone or hurt someone e someone's ego if you speak well of someone else. Um, and on social media, I found this is particularly dangerous because everyone might have different opinions about people and even something you think is good could trigger um, a whole discourse that you didn't intend. Now that said, we are encouraged to look for the good in other people, to try to put as much force and energy behind that practice. And there's a beautiful story about Christ and his followers passing a dead, decaying, stenching dog. And all of his followers started pointing out, oh, look at how it looks. And oh, it smells so terrible. And they were all speaking the truth. It was a dead dog. But Christ found the one good thing about the dog and said, oh, but look at how white and shining its teeth are. Like this is the standard of looking for the good in other people. And the next slide, please. And we have been asked to love humanity for God's sake. That humanity is very imperfect. And we will always become unhappy if we focus on that. But if you look towards God, you will love them and be kind to them. And in all things, I think all you have to do is sincerely ask your creator to help you do this. Help me handle these conversations at work. Help me to see the good in other people. Help release me from my own judgments. Next slide, please. And this is possibly my favorite because I feel that right now often, um, the backbiting is less so because someone, you know, hurt someone else or it's less that there's like offense happening on an interpersonal level, but there's a lot of outrage at just how people think or how we perceive other people think. And there's a lot of separation, like, well, I'm not going to talk to people who think that way, or if you think that way, don't talk to me. And... And, and we often backbite in lieu of that. And the Baha'i writings ask us not 
to turn away from people who think differently than us. All are seeking truth, and there are many roads leading there too. Truth has many aspects, but it remains always and forever one. And I love that. Truth is not relative, but truth is a very, very big picture. And we all have our different roads and we're all seeking the same thing. Do not allow difference of opinion or diversity of thought. And I love that phrase to separate you from your fellow men or be the cause of dispute, hatred, or strife in your hearts. Rather, search diligently for the truth and make all men your friends. Next slide, please. Yay, and then we're all friends. <laughs> so that's, we can close the screen share now. So that is, you know, an overview on the Baha'i faith and this prohibition of backbiting. Hi, Adam. So um, at this point, I think Mata is going to moderate. Maybe we'll sort of tag team depending on how you want to do it. But I would love to hear thoughts, questions. And um, as far as questions, I hope as a group we can work on answering them because I certainly don't have all the answers by far. But I'd love to learn from you. So what have we got? At this point, you can just unmute yourself and um, ask Jackie a question, have a conversation. Uh, you don't have to put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, unless you would like to, you can. I was just thinking as you were talking, Jackie, you know, so many people do these 30-day challenges, you know, they're pretty popular. And I was thinking, I wonder if I could do a 30-day challenge of just not talking about anyone in a divisive way. I mean, I'm a Baha'i. I've been Baha'i all my life. And yet, of course, as Sherry was saying earlier, this is challenging for us as well. We're humans. Everyone has a difficult time with it. But I was thinking, wow, what if I did a 30-day challenge? I wonder, would I just be more silent? Because mm -hmm. as you were speaking, you were saying that we um, should uh, not participate in talking about other people even in general and I was thinking wow then what's there left to talk about if I'm not talking about other people <laughs> which really shows that um, I need to elevate my conversations. <laughs> I think that is I mean I would love that as like an action step if anyone wants to join us in this 30 day without talking about other people challenge um, I, that sounds like a great learning exercise. Like, well, what, what will you discover to talk about if you're not going to talk about other people? Yeah. yeah. One of the thoughts that I had uh, as you were talking is looking at the larger world and what's going on is that because of the amount of really one-way conversations, because backbiting is somebody talking about something that doesn't have the ability to respond. And you see so much of that in, in, in politics to the point that what is true is very obscured. And, and we mm -hmm. have this, even to the point of conversation where alternative facts, the idea that there's more than one truth. And, and I think that that's one of the, the, the things that has happened in society as a general. There's so much conversation about things uh, in a negative way that the 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 uh, obstruction of what is true what is factually correct is so obscure that people are confused and frustrated and it creates more of this tribalistic feeling about race about religion about politics and that you know that that's one of the ills that comes from this behavior that you're always talking about someone else generally in a negative way totally and you know, it makes me think of that quote that I shared, chaos and confusion are daily mm. increasing. Like when you don't even, can't even like be clear about, yeah, what, what's really happening. It's, it's very, um, well, the quote says, it's going to reach such a point that humanity will be unable to bear it. And I think we all have a little inkling of what that feels like. I can only see so many people at a time on my screen. So if you want to say something, just feel free to jump in. I'd like to say something. Um, mm -hmm. One of the hardest thing that I have a hard time with is, let's say, actually witness something wrong that's being done. And right. then somebody else is telling me, 
no, no, this and that. It's like so hard for me to say, wait a minute, but that's wrong. Didn't you say, did you see how this was blah, blah, blah. And so mm -hmm. um, that's the most difficult thing sometimes yourself seeing somebody being vicious or whatever. And then you feel like, how do I deal with that? Because staying silent just burns me inside. I just want to scream. But at the same time, like you just said, Amata said, well, let's stay silent. But it really hurts us physically and mentally and trying to just stay spiritual and close my eyes and just pray and say, God, help me. What would Abdu Baha do? Or what would some Christ do in this situation? And this is the difficult part as human beings trying to hold in when you know it's wrong and sometimes, it, you know, you know that you witnessed the right and wrong and yet you feel like, how do you speak to that? And how does somebody deal with, so how, how do you feel, how do you deal with something like that, Jackie? Yeah, totally. Well, I'm so glad that you brought that up because there are a few exceptions from this perspective of the Baha'i writings. So first off, if something needs to be reported, like if something is categorically wrong, whether it's against um, the laws of your faith in a very flagrant way that's damaging to others, or whether it's illegal or whatever, like, by all means, report that. Like, it's not backbiting to tell the police you saw someone rob someone's house, you know? Um, and uh, so, so there's that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't stay silent to the harm, detriment of other people. Instead, we should handle the situation in an appropriate way, right? Um, go to the source that can actually do something about it. And then if it's just, you know, something that's just really, you know, bothered you, um, there is a quote, and I don't know if maybe we could, maybe we already did, or maybe we can put the document with all the quotes in the chat. But um, there was a, a question asked in some of the literature I was reading, like, well, what about if you're really like, depressed or you're really upset about something and the advice given was that often there's a way if you want to consult with your friends and you you don't just want to vent you actually want them to help you figure out some constructive way forward th that you can talk about things often without actually using names and talking about specific individuals um, so that's also an option um, so yeah try to see if there's something you can actually do about it um, if it's illegal or hurting people report it and then if it's just that you need to get it off your chest and you can't really address it then just try not to talk about people's names you know be interested if, if anyone else has thoughts on that Jackie, I don't know if this is correct, but this is how I've handled it in the past. If if the person I'm speaking to, sh I'm sharing my heart with, doesn't know the other individual, I feel like it's okay. So I guess that's kind of like they don't know that other person, so I'm not changing mm -hmm. their view. And that's been the barometer for me. Is what I'm saying going to change this other person's perspective on someone else. I think the idea is to let people give them a chance to make their own opinion about an issue or about someone else. And when we backbite, we don't allow others to meet one another and create their own opinions. They become tarnished by our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when I have a friend that doesn't know another friend, I might say, you know, my friend did this and I just, and I might even name them because I know they're never going to meet each other. Is that okay? Or is that still harming the spirit of the other person? Yes. Walter wants to say something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't, um, in my opinion, it's, not okay to do that because we never know number one if and when they'll meet that person and that bad opinion in their head is how they will greet that individual and on the other hand but uh, even more than that it's creating disunity in the, when we say uh Baha'i prayers we're told that they can affect the spirit of those 
even those who aren't with us. Mm. So when we create this unity, we're throwing all that stuff out and it affects uh, the, the universe, may I say that? Mm -hmm. And creates just that amount of, of uh, stuff in the air that we are trying to get rid of by spreading love. It's not spreading love, it's spreading um, gossip and, and uh, innuendo and, and uh, displeasure and it creates uh, something else I read, maybe I don't know how true it is, that the backbiting is the worst, worst I mean, is worse than uh, murder because you can kill one per you can kill a person once, only once. <laughs> But if you attack and assassinate their character, it lives for thousands of years mm. in terms of how it, people view then that person as they read through history or whatever it might be. Wow. And on social media, it, it lives for thousands of years. Yeah. True, true. Yeah. I think the Baha'i faith, uh, backbiting is the third sin after murder, now, murder is not killing. Killing and murder are separated. We could discuss that later. After murder and uh, the, uh, uh, gosh, it just popped uh, out of my mind. Um, anyways, um, the third sin uh, and. Arson? That it is, I'm sorry? Arson? No, 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 no. It's, huh? it's, uh, uh, Adul adultery. Murder? Adultery. Wonderful. Thank oh. you, Kent. <laughs> yeah. Um, after murder and adultery, the backbiting is a known third sin in Baha'i faith. Wow. And in my opinion, when we, uh, when, when we go into from, I guess, psychological, psychological perspective, when we go through the, processes of the backbiting we basically get into the habit and it could mm. uh, willingly or unwillingly repeat itself and the immediate detriment is on ourselves and the backbiting uh, being a spiteful uh, word said about someone else uh, is tries intentionally or unintentionally to vilify the, the, the targeted person. Mm -hmm. And as Jackie was explaining, um, it's, it is causing the, Walter mentioned it too, it is causing this unity and just is the, it's, it's, it's a matter that takes the uh, humanity away from what is intended to be. Mm -hmm. Totally. I see Leanne wants to say something. Yeah, and I really liked her question. I forgot her name, Hapu. Hapu? <laughs> Mata. <laughs> okay, I'm Mata. sorry, I, I couldn't change my name. Okay. Um, that's my husband's email. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, I really like your question, but I agree that um, it would still be harmful because it to me, it creates this kind of us versus them mentality, and it would reinforce, um, like, my perception. It, so, you know, it's not, my perception isn't reality, as if we have this, like, capital T truth, and nobody has the full piece of that. But um, I think it's only, only when we get to a place where we feel like we're doing actual consultation that it could be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, one, one thought that I had that uh, we're told as Baha'is that uh, all that has been created is a reflection of God, that science and religion are interconnected, and that, you know, Baha'u'llah talks about the unity of mankind. Unity is a big theme throughout the Baha'i faith, and in science, there's a theory that hasn't been definitely proven, the string theory, the idea that all matter, all things are connected invisibly, uh, and that when one thing uh, is done there's a rippling effect and you know we in the eastern philosophy there's the idea of karma what you give out comes back to you and there may be scientific truths to that that the fact is as we create 
uh, unity, unity is created in the world, but we create dissension, dissension is created in the world. And so going back to this conversation of how we conduct ourselves and what we say and don't say, you know, if we are conscious of the fact that our words have an impact to the person we're talking to, and as Walter said, to something beyond that, to, to the interconnection between things, it, it helps mm -hmm. put that in perspective. But there is, there is a moderation of that because on the other hand, as Baha'is, we're told we need to know each other. We need to become intimately aware of each other's nature and character. So in choosing friends and choosing an assembly, uh, regional delegate, national assembly, all of that, we're, we're, not done that, we're not doing that through politicking. We're not doing that through endorsing somebody, but we're doing it through personal knowledge. And personal knowledge takes you know, getting to, to talk with someone, to be able to understand who they are. So uh, there's a moderation in all of this. Mm -hmm. Can I give one quote that I really like? Sure. And then uh, Roya, I think Roya wanted to say okay. something after. So um, Abdul Baha, who was pretty much the great teacher of the Baha'i faith. I love this. This was his advice. If a man has 10 good qualities and one bad one, to look at the 10 and forget the one. And if a man has 10 bad qualities and one good one, to look at the one and forget the 10. So I don't always tell myself that whole quote, but there's times when <laughs> at work I kind of mutter to myself 10 and one. 10 and 1. <laughs> Sometimes it's 1 and 10, but it kind of flips it, and I realize, I, it, it kind of checks me to realize, wait a minute, I'm looking at all the 10, and I need to look at the 1, because this is hurting my heart. This is, mm. this is hurting me to do this. Yeah. So um, get a grip, Phyllis. <laughs> um, I was thinking it's one of those things that it's definitely learned. Like, I think if you don't see it around you, you probably won't learn it. I think to some extent it's learned by, you know, we see somebody talk about somebody else, so we think it's okay. And then on the other hand, also, I think it takes a certain amount of courage that is probably innate to talk or voice our issues with the person that is bringing it up to us, right? So I think... It should be very normal for us to feel like, okay, I have this issue with this person, so I'll just go and handle it with this person. But I don't know what happens at what point that maybe we feel um, powerless, maybe we feel it's useless, or something, some mechanism, I don't know, <laughs> psychologically, that makes us think, well, I'm not going to be able to do this, either because they're way too high, or I don't have the power to reach them, or maybe I did try to talk to them and just didn't get through to them. And then we think, okay, that's not gonna work. So for me to kind of feel better, I gotta go and talk to somebody else, you know, find a third party. And then that's how I, um, I feel like, okay, I'm better now. I'm above them or I'm reaching them. So it's very interesting, you know, why do we do this and how we can overcome it and how we can teach children to not do it to to voice there but that requires um, i think creating spaces where maybe at work that we can all talk about things or as soon as something happens we can resolve it not keep it for a long time and then feel like okay now now i have to some other mechanism you know i think it's very interesting i wow. think the point the point you made about resolution is very important because how we resolve these kinds of issues has everything to do with what lingers, mm -hmm. what stays in your mind and what stays in the recipient's mind of the conversation. Mm. Wow. You know, that's really profound. The two points you guys highlighted just then, the teaching children and trying to resolve issues. And Roy, I love that you mentioned courage, that it takes a certain amount of um, empowerment. If again, we feel very small in the situation, maybe it's like a policy we don't like, what on earth, what power do we have? Well, if you can't just talk about it, maybe you'll think about, well, what could I do? Who could I write or who could I call? 
And if it's in our personal life, it does take courage to try to address things constructively, but lovingly. And I love that in the practice of this one thing, to try to honor this prohibition against backbiting, that it brings together all of these other virtues. Like it helps us develop courage. We are forced to try to practice non-judgment or forgiveness, you know, like in this one thing, it's helping, you know, we're really developing our spiritual wings by, by just trying to honor this one thing we've been, we've been asked to do. I think we're getting close to our time, but Claudia wants to say something. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to say that, uh, throughout my career, women that I've worked with, when it's going to be a positive growing experience, we've needed to nurture and encourage each other of how to work with someone who is uh, causing them difficulty. You know, someone might rub them wrong, does not rub me wrong. And so I don't know exactly how we can help coach each other because uh, let's say like Mata and I, she wants to help me uh, be able to feel that I'm confident to talk to my friend about this issue. And, um, you know, whether she knows a friend or doesn't, you know, I'm just saying real wise, you know, I have had many people that I've talked to to try to ask for advice so that I could find forgiveness so that like today you talked about, um, when you are thinking about somebody else's faults, take that focus and move it to yourself. You know, what, how can I rethink this so that it, her fault isn't a fault? You know, it is a way of viewing her. So shifting that perspective. But I mean, it feels like we need each other's nurturing and uh, encouragement and to be able to work ourselves through that. So it's hard to do that. And we need to do this before we get to the person because we don't want to hurt mm. the person. We don't want to have a situation where, you know, uh, it's not positive. So it's kind of like, how do you get coaching before you talk to the person straight, straightforward? Totally. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the simplest thing would, as long as the purpose isn't to vilify that other person, right? You're not energetically trying to tear them I, down. I, I think it's important to say that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To say, you know, I'm discussing this with you because I am not wanting to condemn or vilify this person. I want to be able to wrap my mind up, up around how I can, you know, uh, appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And then try not to say their name, you know, Mm -hmm. um, if possible. Walter. People always figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I I get that. I do. Um, You were close to ending this, but I wanted to just uh, read a quote from uh, Baha'u'llah. Please. Um, It, uh, you know, we we know that uh, speech is a powerful thing. So this quote says, for the tongue is a smoldering fire and excess of speech a deadly poison. Material fire consumeth the body, whereas the fire of the tongue devoureth both heart and soul. Wow. Anything you wanted to say? I feel like there's um, some really important prep work that we have to do before having those conversations. If we're sincerely trying to do consultation, we need to make sure that we are not angry and upset and pray. And I think praying with the person you're speaking with is ideal too, to make sure that they are prepared to talk about this topic. Yeah. Leanne, I have to ask, did you ever get the tattoo? The backbiting yeah. tattoo? You haven't? Okay. I just posted about it um, right, like, earlier today. Um, yeah. I showed a picture of it and your class for this. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. It's on so, Facebook. Le- 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've seen the finished thing, so I'm going to have to go find your, your post. Can, can you share um, it? Can you drop it into the chat? <laughs> the image? Um, can yeah. I do that? Hmm. So Leanne actually has a, a, a tattoo about the, um, I guess, the damages of backbiting or like just how important it is to her to not backbite. Yeah. And it's on your back, right? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. just on my uh, upper shoulder and back. Uh, although I don't think I can put a picture in here. A link to the Facebook post maybe? There, yeah. well, there is, uh, if you go into the chat, it says file. And if you linger over the file, you can go into your computer and get it. Yeah. Um, so while okay. Leanne is working on that, <laughs> I think I think it's wonderful because it's a constant reminder, right? It's like on her body. So, <laughs> so you can't be caught backbiting, Leanne. People will point to your back <laughs> and say, "Hey," um, and I feel like I've I've been um, put on notice because several of my friends are here uh, in this <laughs> conversation. So next time I participate in backbiting, they're going to call me out. So <laughs> that's a good thing. But I was going to say, Jackie, um, you know, before we close, I just feel like we have to um, have you demonstrate for us, um, use your acting skill, improvisational skills um, to show us how to respond when we are in the midst of the fire of the tongue. Um, and how do we tactfully and firmly remove ourselves or yeah. stop the backbiting that's happening? How do we do that without offending? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you should ask because I think this is the most challenging part, really, um, because I've found in my own experience that, you know, you ever notice, like, if somebody owes you a few bucks, like, they get mad at you. Like when people owe you money, they get mad at you for some reason. Um, and I, and I've, so I didn't want to like dampen this whole conversation by sharing that, but I feel like it often, um, I think someone has to be very, they have to be very spiritually awake to be like, you're right. Thank you. You know, I feel like it, because backbiting usually is coming from more of a lower nature, we're already kind of in that space and it's um, for someone to sort of like offer us that light to be like, you know, my dear friend, please let's not do this. Um, you know, like darkness, you know, that energy doesn't always like having a light shined on it, you know, but I, I have heard some beautiful examples and I will share them. Um, one is actually in the, the quotes that I, I gave you guys, but um, I'll share the other one first. So a beautiful example I heard once was that, you know, there was um, two friends or like three friends together and someone was starting to talk about someone. And the listener said, I'm afraid if you continue with this story you're going to tell me, I'm afraid I'm going to end up liking one of you less. <laughs> which like is <laughs> a very interesting way and I think it was done with great love but like one way or another like this is gonna hurt someone's relationship here and then Abdul Baha whom you mentioned Phyllis who is a wonderful example of practicing the Baha'i faith um, says that you know to say is there any useful purpose that this is going to serve, you know, and, um, and most likely there's not, it's just going to dampen our zeal. That's where that quote comes from. And, um, and ultimately it's going to be divisive. Um, well, actually it, it's the extinguished shift, the light of the soul. So those are some kind of high level examples and very lofty ways to, to handle it. Um, what are other people's thoughts? Like, how have you, Leanne, or someone who's really, like, um, very conscientiously practiced this, how do you do it without, you know, 
making that person feel judged that right isn't that kind of the issue you don't want the person talking to you feel judged like oh i'm way too good of a person to have this discussion with you like how do you not have that tone but also like raise the whole thing up and probably just trying to avoid stories about other people in general is like a good a good thing changing Um, the subject sometimes just changing the subject to something else uh, without having to bring it to their attention yeah totally can leanne do you have any tips yeah well that's one reason i got the tattoo right so i could (laughs) bring it up when not in the middle of somebody doing this to me right so uh that's been pretty cool um and usually when i am in that situation i need to um or i start by saying i really care about you and i really care about your suffering but i don't feel like this is a good idea you know say the things but mostly try to empathize with them Um, that's a good point give them an out towards consultation if they want to take it that way that's awesome I've also heard of someone who just always went to the bathroom when people started. <laughs> and they were like, why is he always going to the bathroom? <laughs> like, excuse me. <laughs> oh, God. That was funny. <laughs> it also gives us an opportunity to elevate that conversation before it gets going in some in that negative way. So um, someone says a word or a key phrase about someone else maybe we can find a way to change that so we elevate the conversation to a wonderful quality of God, kindness, patience, all those kinds of things. So we're always yeah. trying to do that in our conversations. Elevate. Totally. And if we do the 30-day challenge, that will also be a wonder. We can do as Leanne said, like, I really care about you and, um, and I would be happy to um, consult if you want to try to find a solution to this without you telling me this person's name um but i'm doing this 30-day challenge where i don't talk about other people so i'm not going to be able to have this discussion (laughs) well cool shall we shall we wrap it up shall we close here sure lovely i I was wondering if i could share oh i can't i was going to share um leanne's tattoo if i could share screen or i downloaded it and um I wanted to share the image, but I don't think I can share my screen, so that's okay. So um, anyway, I wanted to just thank everyone for being here, and um, it would be interesting to put this into practice and just see what else do we talk about if we're not talking badly about other people, or do we find a way of removing ourselves tactfully? Um, Do we elevate the conversation, um, how we approach it? So thank you, Jackie, for for being here and helping to make us better people. Um, You're always so wonderful to listen to, so articulate. And um, I just love this conversation. So hopefully we'll have um, another one next month and it'll be on a different topic. Um, And we will invite you to that. So thank you for joining us, everyone.